Come on, let's give, come on, let's give the Lord another hand clap of praise. I need you to survive. Thank you, Brother Darius, for that wonderful solo. Are you ready for the word of God? Amen, 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 amen. Turn with me to the book of Matthew. Matthew, the eighth chapter. Let's look at the book of Matthew, the eighth chapter. And we're going to start at verse 14. Matthew, Matthew 8, verse 14 through verse 17. Amen. Matthew, the eighth chapter verse 14 through 17. I'll be reading from the New King James Version. If you have the word of God, please stand for the reading of his word. Amen. Matthew 8, verse 14 through 17. And it reads as follows. Now, when Jesus had come into Peter's house, he said his wife's, he saw his wife's mother lying sick with a fever. So he touched her hand and the fever left her as she arose and served them. When evening had come, they brought to him many who were demon-possessed, and he cast out the spirits with the word, and healed all who were sick, that it might be fulfilled, which was spoken by Isaiah the prophet, saying, he himself took our infirmities and bore our sicknesses. I would like to preach just for a few minutes on the subject, now that's a miracle. Now that's a miracle. Last week, uh, as you know, we're continuing with the series of the ministry of Jesus Christ. And last week was episode four, where we dealt with uh, when the devil sees you. We dealt with Jesus. If he's the king of kings and the Lord of lords, if he came to die on the cross for our sins, that means he had to show power over the power of darkness. And we saw last week that Jesus had power over the kingdom of Satan when he cast out the demon and the, and the young man. So we saw that. Now today, Today, we're going to find out that Jesus not only has power over demons, but he has power over sickness. He has power over everything. Remember, Jesus is God in the flesh. And the things that you read about Jesus in the word of God, I want to let you know right now, you're not going to see it happen through anyone else, even in healings. And we're going to explain that, what I mean by that in a minute. But today, this is episode five from, the, from season two of the ministry of Jesus Christ. Now that's a miracle. Looking at verse 14, 14 and 15, and I only have two points today, two points in this outline, and if you want to write this down, the two points will be point one, the miracle of fulfillment, the miracle of fulfillment, and then point, that's verse 14 through uh, verse 14 and 15, and then the fulfillment of of the miracle, point two, the fulfillment of the miracle, verse 16 and 17. Okay, now the first point one, the miracle of fulfillment. Look at verse 14 and 15 again. Watch this. Now, when Jesus had come into Peter's house, he saw his mother's, his, his wife's mother lying sick with a fever. So he touched her hand and the fever left her as she arose and served him. The miracle of fulfillment. Now, we see here, the first thing we see is that Peter's wife's uh, mother was sick. First of all, Peter had a wife. Some denominations believe that Peter didn't have a wife. You know, the Catholic Church uh, teach that 
uh, Peter was the first pope and all that kind of stuff and that he didn't have a wife. But it says right here that Peter had a wife. A lot of those disciples had a wife. It is God's will, if a man wanted to be married, that he can take on a wife. God never said that if you become a minister that you must become celibate. He never said that. That's not in scripture. So when you see denominations that try to force people not to be married, scripture says in 1 Corinthians that you, you better be careful of people that try to get you, number one, to heed to the doctrines of not being married. The doctrine of eating to idols. The doctrines of, 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 of walking through the flesh. He says, stay away from those type of doctrines. Peter had a wife because this is his mother in law. And the scripture says, now when Jesus had come into Peter's house, he saw his wife's mother lying sick with a fever. Now I want to say something about this fever. The fever that she had, evidently, if it was a fever that caused her to lay sick and they didn't have the medicine that we have today, she was really sick unto death. She just wasn't laying down because she had a headache. She wasn't laying down because she wasn't feeling well. She was laying down because she was really sick unto death. It could have been malaria. It could have been some other type of high fever that in a few days, it could have took her out of this life. And notice what it says, what Jesus did. And this is where I want to stop and talk about healing just for a minute. He says, verse 15, so he touched her hand and the fever left. He touched her hand and the fever left as she arose and served them. Okay, number one about healing. Uh, Jesus. There's a difference between the way Jesus healed and the way people so-called heal today. Too many times people want to say that they have a healing ministry or they want to say that they heal just like Jesus healed. Well, it says here that Jesus just touched her hand and she was healed. He didn't pray with her. He didn't cast out no demons. He didn't call on the Father. He just walked by, touched her hand, she got up. That's power. That's healing. You know why he could do it that way? Because he's God in the flesh. Jesus is God in the flesh. Every time I see other people healing, I watch TV just like you watch TV. You see the televangelists. I mean, they grabbing on people, shaking on folks, pushing them down, blowing them down, all kinds of stuff. And then when the person get back up, three weeks later, they end up dead. Now, wait a minute. I thought I went through all this. Why am I still dying? Then the preacher on the TV would tell you, well, it was your faith. That's why you still die. You'll never see an example of that in the scripture. You'll never see an example of Jesus healing somebody and three weeks later, they they did because of something that they did wrong. When Jesus heals, he heals immediately. The difference between Jesus' ministry of healing and your ministry of healing today is this. When Jesus healed, he's God in the flesh, he heals immediately. When we ask for healing, we got to call on God. We got to call on the name of Jesus. And then just because you call on the name of Jesus, you need to say, if it be your will, Lord. Because just because you pray don't mean that you're going to be healed immediately. And just, just, just to remember, to remind you that when you pray for healing, you got to be patient and wait on God. So the healing ministry of Jesus is this. Jesus healed immediately. There are all kinds of examples of Jesus healing people. Yes, there are examples of Jesus saying your faith hath made you whole. Yes, but there are a lot of examples where Jesus didn't ask them anything. He just healed them. And we're going to see that even in this passage of scripture that by after he healed her, something happened. He also, other people brought their sick ones and other people brought demon possessed people and we're gonna see what happened to them. There are several miracles in this passage that I wanna talk about. Number one, the miracle of fulfillment. And let's talk about that right quick. A, Matthew says in verse 16 and 17 that it might be fulfilled which was spoken of Isaiah the prophet. Now that phrase that it might be fulfilled was said by Matthew 15 
times in the book of Matthew. Matthew quotes the Old Testament 36 times, more than any other gospel. There are over 40 messianic uh, prophecies that Jesus fulfilled. What's a messianic prophet? A messianic prophecy is this. It's Old Testament scriptures that talk about what Jesus is going to do in the future. It's Old Testament scriptures that talk about what the Messiah is going to do in the future. As a matter of fact, it was prophesied in the Old Testament that he would be born of a virgin. It was prophesied in the Old Testament that he would come out of Egypt. It was prophesied in the Old Testament that he's going to bring his kingdom down. So there are over 40 passages in the Old Testament that talks about Jesus and him fulfilling messianic prophecy. There are also over 300 prophecies that talk about the return of Jesus Christ. There are 300 prophecies that have not been fulfilled yet that talk about Jesus and his return. So we know that there are, a, there are what we call miracles of fulfillment, meaning that Jesus is going to fulfill every last one of these prophecies. The reason the Bible gives us all these predictions, the reason the Bible tells you that he was born of a virgin 700 years before he was born of a virgin, the reason the Bible tells you out of Egypt I have called my son 700 years before he was called out of Egypt, so that is proof enough to you that Jesus is who he said he is. Oh yeah, that's proof enough, that's proof enough. Jesus didn't have, the, the miracles was icing on the cake, that's what that was, but Jesus never really did the miracles so you can believe you was really supposed to believe because the word says it. You were supposed to believe because it was written down. He said, wait a minute, didn't scripture say that this, the Messiah would, and he's doing what the scripture said. He got to be the Messiah. Now, if anybody, so anybody could have fulfilled those prophecies, can't be true. Nobody, here's the probability of just one person tried to fulfill 12 of the Old Testament prophecies. The probability is this, is one in gazillion. <laughs> that one person could fulfill just 12 Old Testament scriptures. You say, well, I still don't get the picture. A gazillion, what is that? Okay, let's take a gazillion quarters and uh, a gazillion quarters will probably look like filling the whole state of Texas. That's a gazillion quarters. The whole state of Texas is filled with quarters. Then let's take one of those quarters out of the gazillion and put a mark on one quarter. And we throw that quarter back into the state of Texas. Then I take Brother Jerome Kenny Jr. and I take him and say, oh, Brother Kenny, uh, why don't you go here in Texas and go find that one quarter I just threw in the state of Texas. His chance of finding the quarter with the mark on it is one in a gazillion chance that he will find it. In other words, he won't find it. So guess what? For anybody to meet just 12 of the prophecies in the Old Testament is one in a gazillion. Jesus met 40. So if you don't believe by now that Jesus is who he said he is, that he's the Messiah, the son of the living God, that he came down wrapped up in human flesh to save your soul, then you won't believe. You just won't believe because I don't, I, I haven't met a person yet that met the prophecy scripture. David Caress came along. You remember him, Waco, Texas, said he was Jesus. Uh-uh. Uh, uh, Jim Jones came by in the 70s and said he was the Messiah. No, no, he didn't do it. Prophet Divine said in the 30s, 1930s, in the 40s, that he, not only was he the Messiah, he was God. And you know what? Some of those people that was in his ministry back in the 30s, they still waiting on him today. Because they think, because you know, he died and they waiting on him to come back. But all of these false preachers are coming down telling you that they are the Messiah and not one of them has fulfilled any of these scriptures. Jesus is the only one that fulfilled the scriptures in the Old Testament. Some people say that, that, that we are walking and believing in Jesus on blind faith. I want to let you know faith is not blind. You're not walking by blind faith. The unbelievers in the world are walking by blind faith. You're not walking by blind. They the one blind because they don't believe in Jesus. You're walking by faith because you are reading what the word of God says and you believe what it says and that settles it. 
That's what you believe. So don't believe them when they say, oh, you're just believing because uh, you're walking by blind faith. No, you got evidence by the word of God that Jesus is who he say he is. Now watch this last two verses. He, he concludes this with the last two verses. And this is the fulfillment of the miracle. Verse 4, 15, verse 16 and 17. When evening had come, they brought to him many who were demon possessed. And he cast out the spirits with the word. Wait a minute. He did what? He cast out the spirits with a word. One. Probably just, just come out. That's it. They came out. Watch this. Then uh, he cast them out with one word and healed all who were sick. It didn't say he healed those who had a little bit of faith. It didn't say he healed those who gave a certain amount of money in the church. It says he healed who? All of them. He didn't ask them their past. He didn't ask them what they were going through. As many as that were sick that they brought to Jesus, he did what? He healed them. And I've seen many uh, crusades on television. I've seen many televangelists on television. And I've seen people wheel people in there in wheelchairs. I've seen them. It, actually, people flying their loved ones from hospitals on hospital beds, taking them to a preacher, to, a, to, to some conference from one state to another, and they wheeled them right back on out after the service was over. Most of the people that you see on television, have you ever noticed? Yeah, it's just me. I guess I, I just I'm, I, I look at things this way. It seems to me that when all the people line up, and then you know you've seen it, and they ask them, "Okay, what, you, what, what have you been healed from?" Now, okay, they don't look sick to me because if if you're telling me what you've been healed from, you're just lining up to tell me what you've been healed from. But I didn't see you sick. You can tell me anything. I want you to go down and lay hands on that guy who was wheeled in here with Sarah palsy. I want you to come down and lay hands on the guy in the, because they don't show you this on TV, but people are doing this. They actually are willing people in hospital beds to these services. People with cancer. People who have a uh, triple bypass and only got two, two hours to live. They bring them to the service because that's their last chance. And they think that this preacher is going to heal them. And they willing them right back on out. But Jesus says here, it says here, he healed who? Them all. Nobody left sick. Could you imagine going to a, a conference with some of these preachers on TV? And it's 10,000 to 20,000. And everybody, half of them sick. And everybody walk out healed. Everybody. Not that I felt a heat go down my back. And then two weeks later, you got to go get your glasses again. Or you got to take your blood pressure, med blood pressure medicine again. No, it's not that kind of healing. When you were healed by Jesus, he healed you completely. Let's thank God for Jesus healing. So not only did he do that, look at verse 17, that it might be fulfilled, which was spoken of by Isaiah the prophet saying, he himself took our infirmities and bore our sicknesses. Now this is a very important passage of scripture because yes, we believe in healing, but we believe in God's healing. God heals and God does miracles today. There are preachers who believe that miracles are not for today. Some preachers believe that God doesn't operate in all of the gifts of the spirit. Now if it's in the word, he operates in the gifts of the spirit. Every last one of them. If it's there, he operates. God is the same yesterday, today, and forever. So if the Bible talks about the gifts of the Spirit, I guarantee you somewhere on this planet, those gifts are in operation. So if there are gifts of healings and gifts of miracles, they are in operation. But you got to watch out because you got your phonies out there. You got your fakes out there. Don't you know that the devil is a counterfeiter? Don't you know that the devil wants people to get caught up into all of the sensation and then he let them, he let them fall. He let them down. You, you mean to tell me you got all these so-called uh, anointed preachers, uh, they could heal all these people, but they can't keep their marriages together. Wait a minute, your family breaking up. But oh, I got to go to the conference to, and then I see you on the news with somebody else's wife. Wait a minute, wait, what? 
All of this stuff is happening with these so-called preachers and yet we're not watching the word of God because we're looking at the man and the ministry and we're, we're not looking at the word of God. Put our trust in Jesus. Okay, you're praying for healing. You've been sick a long time, but he gives you an answer right here in this passage. Watch this. I love this. The passage that Matthew quotes is Isaiah 53. Verse 4 and 5, and I'm going to read it in its entirety, and I'm going to give you four points, and I'm going home. Watch this. He says this. Isaiah 53, 4 and 5 says this. Surely he took up our infirmities and carried our sorrows, yet we considered him stricken by God, smitten by him and afflicted. But he was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed with, for our iniquities, the punishment that brought us peace was upon him, and by his stripes, by his wounds, we are healed. Now, I want to let you know right now, he's talking about physical healing, yes. And, but the most healing he's talking about is what? Spiritual healing. Too many times people want the physical healing before they want the, the spiritual healing. Lord, fix my body so you can go sin some more. Lord, fix my, I, I'm tired of, Lord, fix my body. I, I got lung cancer, okay? You smoked for 30 years. What else do you think was going to happen to you? Lord, I got cirrhosis of the liver. How much did you drink for the past 30 years? That's what happens when you take drugs. That's what happens when you drink. You tear down your body. Now, after you done tore it up, now you want God to fix it in one day. Lord, heal me. I want to be a servant for you. It doesn't work that way. You need to say, Lord, the hours I got left, the days I got left, I want to use for you. If it be your will, Lord, yes, I want to be healed. Yes, I want a few more days. But the days I got left, guess what I'm gonna use them for you that's what I want to do your physical healing is not more important than your spiritual healing and your spiritual healing comes because you want to see somebody else spiritually healed watch what he says four points we're gonna break down this verse Isaiah 53 verse 4 and 5 down and he says this some people behind uh, believe believe that miracles are over we don't believe that it says in Hebrews 13 and 8 that God is the same yesterday today and forever let's look at these four points number one he took our infirmities that's what the verse says right he took Jesus took our infirmities the word infirmities in the Hebrew means weaknesses he took your weaknesses has anybody been weak do we have some weaknesses amen all of us, if you're a human being, you got some weaknesses. And guess what? He took them all. We're going to explain what that means. What do you mean weaknesses? Any addiction, any problem, any habit, he took them all. We don't understand. You know, we always talk about the cross and what Jesus did at the cross, but Isaiah just breaks it down in four ways of what he put, what was put on him on the cross. Number one, all of your habits, all of your addictions, all of your weaknesses are placed on Christ at the cross. That means this, any habit that you have, any addiction that you have, Jesus took it so you can't use as an excuse anymore, I can't live for you because I have an addiction. Oh, wait a minute, you do? I, I, I took that 2,000 years ago. So all you got to do is put your trust in me, not in the addiction. You got to put your trust in me and not in the habit. You got to put your trust in me and not in what you think that you have to be bound to. Be bound to me. Get addicted to me. I guarantee you, you won't get addicted to anything else. That's something, you know, the scripture says when a spirit is gone out of a man, the house is clean, swept clean. But you got to watch it. The scripture also says that same demon that was, that left, he coming back. And he comes back and look in the house that he left. And if he sees that the house is still clean, it's still empty, 
He coming back in, and the scripture says he's coming back with seven worse demons than himself. What does, it mean? What does, what does that mean? Watch this. If you've been uh, uh, separated or you've been set free from addictions and uh, weaknesses, this is what happens. These demons are gone. But when you, if you want to get rid of any weakness, you got to replace a weakness with God's word. You got to replace it with something else. If you pull it out of you, that, that habit that you had, you was doing that habit so long, now you got to place it with another habit. You got to place it with a good habit because if you don't place it with a good habit, the bad habit coming back. Oh, yes, it is. Because the demon's coming. Well, he didn't. I've been gone three months. All right, he's still, he ain't praying. He ain't doing nothing. The house is just like I left. Okay, he ain't ready, he ain't ready yet. So I'm going right back in. And then you wonder why people fall harder the second time, the third time. It get worse. Okay, now I lost 20, but now I got to lose 40 now. Because I lost the 20, gained the 20 back, then put 20 more on. So now I got to lose 40. It always happens over and over again. You got to replace the weakness with God's word. If you don't replace it, it's going to get worse. Yes. Living the life of Jesus Christ is a habit way of living. It's not that we come to church on Sunday. See, what you get today is not enough. What you get today is for today and maybe tomorrow. That means you got to get up and read the word for Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, Saturday. You got to read, you got to pray, you got to meditate. What you hear today is for you today, but you got to get in God's word every day. You got to pray every day to keep the demons away. You know, you know, the doctors say take, take two, two what, an apple a day keeps the, the doctors away. No, a prayer a day, a word a day keeps the demons away. <laughs> If the scripture says this in Romans and in 1 Corinthians, we have to, if there be any virtue, if there be any praise, he said, think on these things. Whatsoever things are honest, whatsoever things are just, whatsoever things are pure, whatsoever things are good report, if there be any virtue and if there be any praise, think on these things. What you thinking about? See, whatever you think about, that's what you're going to act on. It starts with the thinking process. And if your thinking is wrong, your believing is going to be wrong. If your believing is wrong, your action is going to be wrong. Change your thinking. Oh, yeah, Romans 12, 1 and 2. Be not conformed to this world, but be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind. Also, yeah, he took your weaknesses. Point number two, not only did he take away your weaknesses, he took something else. It says in that verse, he carried our, what? Sorrows. So he took away your weaknesses. Point two, he carried your sorrows. What is sorrows? The Hebrew word for the word sorrows is grief. Grief means that you are upset about something, that you lost something. Some of us lost jobs. Some of us lost loved ones. Some of us lost a whole lot of things in our lives. But he says this, he took even your sorrow. So guess what? I should not have a pity party of myself because I lost something. I need to know that Jesus took everything that I went through and said I can make it anyhow. Even your grief, even your sorrow. It was Martin Luther King Jr. that said this. He said, you need to teach your children that failure is as much a part of life as success. You need to teach. See, some people, they, they, they uh, tell their children, oh, baby, you're the best thing that ever happened. Oh, you'll never, you'll never fail. You'll never succeed. You are teaching your children a lie. You got to prepare your children. Listen, baby, when you grow up, some doors going to be slammed in your face, but you better keep going. Yeah, yeah, baby, some jobs may not call you, but you better, you better keep going. Yes, that school may not accept you, but this school will. You better keep going. Yes, you're going to get some doors closed in your face. Guess what? Everybody don't love you. We love you because we're your parents, but everybody don't love you like we do. And you got to prepare your children and you got to prepare them for grief. And Jesus says, I took all of your grief. So two things at the cross, your weaknesses and your grief. Wait a minute, what else could there, what else could he put on the cross? You know what, people try to drown their griefs with drugs, with alcohol, with, with uh, promisc promiscuousness. You can't do that. Turn it over to God and he'll work everything out. You know what, instead of carrying your sorrows, because that's what we try to do, we try to carry them, 
First Peter says this, five and seven, cast all of your cares, that's sorrows, upon him for he cares for you. When are we going to go to God in prayer and turn everything over to him? Really turn everything over to him. Here's the third thing. So he was, he was, he took our weaknesses. He took our sorrows. Here's the third thing. He was pierced for our transgression and crushed for our iniquities. It sounds like, it sounds like this, that Isaiah was right there at the cross. Did you know it says he was pierced? When Jesus was pierced in the hands and in the feet, it says it wasn't done for him. It was because of your transgression. It was because of your iniquity, yours and mine, meaning what is transgression? What are iniquities? Sin, he was pierced, if you put this image in your mind, when they nailed him to the cross, that was for you. It wasn't for him. He didn't commit a sin. He says he was pierced for your sins and my sins. Watch this. That means guilt. That's number three. We talked about weaknesses. We talked about sorrows. The third thing he died for was your guilt. What am I guilty of? You are guilty of being a sinner. I didn't do anything wrong. Well, if you didn't do anything wrong, you're guilty just because you was born a sinner. The scripture says we are born in sin and shaped into iniquity. When Adam sinned in the Garden of Eden, when he sinned, he, it, it was embedded into his DNA. So therefore, every child he had after he fell received his DNA. And if his DNA was tainted with sin, so is yours. So every person born after Adam and Eve has of sinful nature, which makes you guilty as charged. But Jesus went to the cross and was pierced for your guiltiness. Wait a minute. He was pierced for my sins. Let me tell you something. Just think about it. Just think about it. Just think about it. You ain't got to think about what you did five years ago. Think about what you did last week. He was pierced for your sins. You could have been what you did last night. He was pierced for your sins, your transgression. Watch this. If he was pierced for my sins, guess what? God has a remedy for our sins, and it's called forgiveness. God forgives us if we put our faith in Jesus Christ. A lot of people, you know what? We're hard on ourselves. We don't forgive ourselves. God has forgiven you through Jesus Christ at the cross. And here you are beating yourself up every day. Uh, ain't nobody going to use me. Ain't nobody love me. I, I messed up again. Guess what? God loves you. You need to get up. Ask God for forgiveness. Lord, I forgive me of my sin. I messed up. I need to get back with you and get back on that saddle again and keep on going. Don't let the devil stop you and fill you up with guilt about sin. You need to say, Lord, forgive me. I know you took it to the cross and I am on the track to turning my life around. No other religion. Let me tell you this. We as Christians, you have to understand this. We as Christians are the only ones that teach that you cannot get to heaven by your works. We the only ones teach that. We the only ones teach that in order to get to heaven, you are saved by grace through faith. It is not of yourselves, it is the gift of God. Islam doesn't teach it. They don't teach it. Jehovah's Witness don't teach it. Mormons don't teach it. All of those other religions teach this. In order for you to get to paradise, you got to be good. And guess what? Your good got to outweigh your bad. So you got to do all these good deeds. And if your good deeds outweigh your bad deeds, then God will let you in. No, Christianity don't teach that. We teach you ain't good enough. You ain't good enough. You can't give more. Than, you can't give all your money away. You can't do nothing to please God but do this except his son. He sent his son to be the good one for you. He knew you couldn't be good by yourself, so he sent his son to die on the cross for you. So you put your faith in his son, you live the life of the son. How do I know you really believe that? Because your life will change. Christianity brings change. I tell people this all the time, we are gonna make mistakes. Oh yeah, we're human. We're going to make mistakes, but a Christian should not be living a life of habitual sin. In other words, saying this, 
well, it's just me, this me, and I'm just going to accept it. Let me tell you something. You need to fight sin. I don't care if you fight it till the day you die, but you need to fight it all the way to the grave. You need to say, I'm not, this is wrong. If I did it, it's still wrong. Ten years from now, it's still going to be wrong. I don't accept it. I fell into it. But guess what? God is a forgiving God. He knows what I'm going through. He knows that I am fighting this thing every single day of my life. Well, some of you don't know this. Uh, well, it was Paul. Paul said this in chapter 7 of Romans. Every time I try to do good, evil is always present. That's what he said, right? Every time you try to live right, the devil is right there trying to stop you. That's what he does. That's his job. He wants to stop you from living right. He wants to stop you from doing God's will. But you say, guess what? He took my transgressions. He was pierced for our sins. He was crushed for our sins. Oh yes, he gave you us a remedy. And the remedy was sin. Last one, and we go home when we say this. By his stripes, we are healed. He took your weaknesses. He took your sorrows. He took your griefs. And guess what? He took your sicknesses. What sicknesses? He took your spiritual sickness, which is sin. We were all sin sick, but when you put your faith in Jesus, he take it all away. And not only does he take away your, your, your spiritual sickness, God is a healer today. He will take away some of your physical sicknesses. Can I get a witness? Have anybody been healed by God? Anybody been sick physically and healed by God? I'm telling you, God is a physical healer and he is a spiritual healer but the, the, the most important one is the spiritual healing comes first so as I go to my seat and I thank God for allowing us to understand that God is a healer and we got to say Lord we thank you for the miracle we thank you for everything you have given us Father, we thank you for everything that you have given us a long time ago. We thank you, Lord, for all of the miracles that we've seen in the past. And I keep hearing people saying that that's a miracle. It's a miracle how? It's a miracle that somebody was saved from a burning car. They say that's a miracle. They say it's a miracle that somebody was saved from a, a plane crashing. But I'm here to tell you today that it's a miracle that God changed your life. I'm here to tell you that God has a lot of miracles in the word. He has miracles all throughout the Old Testament. You remember the miracle that God opened up the Red Sea and allowed the children of Israel to walk down the Red Sea. Now that's a miracle. You remember the miracle that Joshua did. He marched around Jericho seven times and the walls came tumbling down. Now that's a miracle. You remember the miracle of Elijah and Elisha, how they held, healed the sick and how they threw an axe in the middle of the water and it floated right to the top. Now that's a miracle. You remember the miracle of the three Hebrew boys. They were thrown into a fiery furnace but nothing hurt them. Now that's a miracle. You remember the miracle of Daniel thrown into the lion's den and he was never touched by the lions. That's a miracle. You remember the miracles of the Old Testament but there are other miracles in the Bible. Come on down to the New Testament. Jesus performed a miracle. He healed the sick. Jesus raised the dead. Somebody might say now that's a miracle. You remember even Paul even the apostles. They had all kinds of miracles the scripture says that they took all the sick and they brought them outside, laid them down the street and Peter just came by and his, his shadow healed all the sick. Now that's a miracle with all of those miracles in the Old Testament, all those miracles in the New Testament, that's not the best miracle. The best miracle is that Jesus came and wrapped himself in human flesh. He he raised the sick, he healed the 
healed the sick. He raised the dead, but he died on Calvary 2,000 years ago. Now that's a miracle. He died for your sins. Now that's a miracle. You want to see a miracle? Then look at Jesus at the cross. When they nailed him to the cross, he nailed your adultery to the cross. Now that's a miracle. He nailed your fornication to the cross. Now that's a miracle. He nailed your lying to the cross. That's a miracle. That's the miracles that he has done. But I'm not done yet. There are many miracles. When he died, he got up on the third day with all power in heaven and in earth in his hands. That's a miracle. And when he did that, he said, if I be lifted up, I'll draw all men unto me. That's a miracle. But wait a minute. It says, if you are in Christ, you are a new creature. Old things are passed away. Behold, all things are become new. Now that's a miracle. He can take a sinner like me, turn me around, place my feet on solid ground. That's a miracle. Did he change you? Did he save you? If he changed you, say yes. If he changed you, say yes. That's a miracle. The miracle that he changed your life. The miracle that he's still changing your life. The miracle that Christ came into your life made a difference in your life. That's a miracle. Come on, put your hands together. Thank you, Lord. That's a miracle. He changed you. He made you. He fixed you. He took all of your sins, all of your sorrows, all of your griefs, everything that you go through. He took it all. You don't have to bear anything. He got it all at the cross. That's the miracle. And he want to give that miracle to you today. Every head bowed and every eye closed. We thank you, God, for everything that you have done to us. We thank you, Father, for Jesus bearing it all on the cross, becoming that miracle, becoming that sacrifice, becoming the one who has delivered us from anything. We're not bound by any sickness, disease, any addiction, because you took it all. All we got to do is put our faith in you. If there's somebody here who don't know Jesus Christ as their Savior, and they want Jesus to be the head of their life. They want Jesus right now to take it off of you. If you never accepted Jesus, right where you sit, every head bowed, every eye closed.